So <laughs> I'm going to say good afternoon to Francis. Does anyone get to call you Frank or are you Francis to everybody? Uh, it's Francis for everybody, usually. It's Francis for everybody. So most people who see this or read this just know, hey, that guy's a drummer who's always working, but you are also a producer. Were you always a producer or is this something that happened in the last few years? I would say I've always dabbled in it for sure. It's always been a, a great interest to me to, um, you know, kind of, you know, think about it when you put the drums down in a session, you're kind of done. Yeah. You, know, you go first usually a lot of the time, the rhythm section tracks first. And so, you know, probably 15 odd years of being in studios after my parts have been done. I've been like, I could probably do this. And uh, I kind of fell in love with that and developed that skill and kind of honed that craft and, one of my favorite things to do by far. Absolutely. It makes you feel like you're part of the music a little bit better than just playing drums. And uh, you get to actually have a conversation with the songs themselves instead of just kind mm. of being the uh, being the muscle early on. In a lot of bands, we find out that the drummer actually plays every instrument really well. Maybe the creative driving force, but is super modest in the background. Are you one of those or you're just a drummer? I'm just a drummer, I would say, because the company that I keep musically, I would never say I play any other instruments, really. I can play bass, I can play a little bit of piano, just for idea, kind of chopping things out. Um, but no, I don't play anything else significantly. I, I sing, I sing yeah. all the time. That's my favorite, besides drums. Yeah, you don't find that most drummers actually sing or can sing while playing. How does that work for you? Because that's, isn't that both sides of the brain going at the same time singing while playing? It could be three parts of the brain at once, but I wouldn't know. It's one of those things. Uh, Levon Helm said it best. You can actually support your own, you know, initiative while you're playing the drums and singing because you, you're in control of both ends of the spectrum. You have the backbeat and you have the lead. So you can make anything work the way you want it to work. And for whatever reason, I can just do it. I have no idea why. I never took any formal lessons for either thing but it just happens at the same time and hmm. uh, <clears throat> i do it when possible somebody a friend of mine who's a drummer not at your level the compliments have just begun francis the the person sang while they're playing drums because they told me it's just boring to rehearse drums by yourself in a room and the singing part broke up the monotony is there any of that for you uh, a little bit of both i would say um i don't like to rehearse drums at all mm -hmm. to be honest like if it's something really intricate and like i have to be locked to a very finite sort of like grid or the song's got to go exactly the way it's going to go every detail threaded together then i'll rehearse that like crazy because that's important but if it's like a uh you know learn the song show up and play kind of thing i don't even practice them i'll just mm -hmm. get my kit and think them out and then see what happens but um yeah the singing thing is really nice to again be part of the music a little bit more you know um i never want to be just a drummer in any sense even while playing drums hmm. got to be musical got to be smart got to be sensitive to everybody else and how they're feeling on a given day especially you know that's the nice part of the road if someone's having a weird day you can knock off a bpm during the show for everything and make them feel better and then put it back later on so it's a it's a mind game in in terms of sensitivity, you know, kudos go to you in terms of your genre hopping. So that band that was opening up those kid rock dates that has nothing to do with the style of music that you play with Matthew Curry has nothing to do with the album that you produced for the artists in the Netherlands, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, has nothing to do with the stuff that you do with Diamond Dave. In other words, sometimes you're doing a rumba and sometimes you're doing metal. Have you always been that versatile or is it that as you got older, you were able to play a little bit of everything? Uh, combination again, I think that's a good thing to have as many combinations as possible. But uh, the uh, the country gig, which it was for the uh, Kid Rock tour, was with a band called Hellbound Glory. I had never met those guys, and we went right into 30 arenas with uh, with no plan really, other than let's meet, rehearse for a day or two, and hit it. But uh, yeah, as far as styles go you got to make it up a little bit as you go, because if you stay too strictly oriented with one thing and calling it a style and being within those, you know, you know, boundary lines, you're going to, you're going to chop yourself up pretty bad. Like you got to be able to just kind of, kind of own it. And if it feels like it should go one way, commit to it all the way and don't 
you know, don't go half-assed. Just just go right in. And Speaking then, of uh, owning it, though, I'm owning up to the fact that I thought that that was a metal band and not a country band based on the name and opening up for Kid Rock. Sometimes with Kid Rock, he's doing the metal thing. Sometimes it's the country. Sometimes he tells you he's a soul singer. You don't know what genre is going to be opening up for Kid Rock. So that was a country thing. And I know that you've relocated from Jersey Shore to Nashville. Does your move to Nashville have anything to do with that band? Initially speaking, yes. Uh, I came through here with that band in 2013. We uh, had the fortune of playing Bridgestone Arena and actually recording a live album that night, which is out. Um, and I, I loved it here then. I, I was like, okay, great. There's a thousand places to play all the time. So I can't miss endless studios and great drum sounds. They're getting great sounds here. And, you know, you don't have to bring anything. You show up and walk in with sticks and you can play a whole record. But um, I want to interject one thing about the genre. Uh, I've been waiting for this for 10 years. It, they are a country band, but they're also a very grunge influenced band. They're from Aberdeen, Washington, obviously the Nirvana scene. Melvin's Nirvana, yeah. And uh, I've been waiting to put this term out there for 10 years. They're a gruntry band. Crunch. Gruntry band. <laughs> do you have that domain or trademark yet? If not, not yet. You know, the first thing you do after we hang up is you're buying the domain Gruntry. Gruntry, yeah. They're a gruntry band. They're, they take from metal too, though. They're a heavy metal band with like country stuff, grunge stuff, you know, whatever shows up. So Gruntry has nothing to do with the album that you just produced that's bringing you to the Netherlands. Any idea what your calling card to getting that gig was producing? Uh, this was actually for a, uh, a very, very talented Dutch artist named Joanne Bird, who I met through uh, a couple friends overseas in Holland, uh, Nick and Roland, if you hear this, you guys. And um, she did a five month tour of the United States this summer and into the fall and played a ton of solo gigs, did a ton of sessions and met all kinds of cool people. Mm -hmm. and, um, I'm fortunate to be one of those people. And we connected in a kind of joined forces to produce this EP down in Jersey. And we did three songs that are coming out soon. The first of which comes out uh, January 26th. And that song is called Who Brought the Rain to Texas? Great song. But um, yeah, as far as getting involved with her, it was more or less just a connection through previous tours I've done overseas, meeting people, you know, staying in touch. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the classic way of uh, doing things. I find if I can reinforce stereotypes on you, positive stereotypes, when you're talking about different genres and touring Europe, you'll find that, for example, this is a metal band. So they're going to do a lot of German and UK dates. This person's a country artist or singer songwriter. OK, they're doing the Netherlands and maybe this part of England. Uh, this person's a power pop artist. So they're going to Spain and France. Am I way off on that uh, from the outsider? I'm sure that's probably true. I mean, the bands I've gone over with are all rock bands, you know, Jersey rock bands, um, Outside the Box, the original band we talked about, and then the Billy Walton band, who I go over with whenever possible. And those guys, again, just dive in. Wherever they're playing, they show up as they are and go for it, which is nice. That's the Jersey way of doing everything, really. <laughs> it, it is, but where I'm going with that is that you'll find that, let's say this person is an arena artist for a country in the US and they decide to do a European tour, which maybe they're gonna lose money on. It's not like they're doing Italy, they're not doing Greece. If they're an operatic uh, operatic metal band, then they go to Greece. It, it's In other words, it's not like you get to tour Europe kind of like you used to back in the day. It's more of a, we're this genre, so we're gonna stick around the Netherlands, this part of England, maybe this part of Ireland, go home. It could very well be true, you know, that's a, uh... I've never had any experience with uh, anything like that yet, but I hope to, you know, I hope okay. to find one. <laughs> Sky is the limit. So, uh, Joanne, you're going over there for a couple of weeks, it sounds like? Yes, we're going to go over uh, middle of March, um, probably the 17th or 18th, and then finish up on the 31st. So pretty much a two-week run, all kinds of shows around her, uh, her country, which is about the same size as Jersey. So, you know, yeah. they'll feel right at home. And, uh, yeah, we're bringing a good band over. We have... Uh, you know, it's an all-American band, mostly from New Jersey, and one guy from Long Island. No, where? Oh, uh, any idea where in Long Island? Uh, yeah, he's near. Uh, he's near Islip. In that okay. Area. But I believe and everyone's near Islip. Yeah, I think he also has a place out in uh, in the Hamptons too. So, you know, I don't know what kind of crap we're getting involved with here, but yeah, I know, I know, shady people 
come from this part of the world, Penn's good fellas. But um, where in Jersey did you record with Joanne? We did it in Asbury Park, of course. The one and only Asbury Park, uh, Lake House Studios. And um, did a couple of days down there. Great team there. They have a phenomenal staff. You know, John, Ashley, Nick, everybody over the, at Lake House. And um, couldn't have gone better. I'm thrilled. And uh, I would recommend that place to anybody. So Asbury is a magical place. And if you're an outsider, somebody who didn't spend a lot of time around the Jersey Shore, you're kind of trying to think, okay, it was Mecca, it was paradise for Springsteen's era, and then it kind of got bad. And then now you see boutique hotels and five-star restaurants and all that kind of stuff in Asbury. When did you start to see it turn around and be this place that has live venues and recording studios and not just a pinball place? It's a good question. So I guess when I was really young it was really bad when i was probably like 15 16 up to 20 mm -hmm. started to pick up some speed it's probably like 2008 2009 it started to be kind of a version of what it is now mm -hmm. there were a lot of burned out buildings uh obviously from the riots in the 70s um a lot of unfinished buildings a lot of unfinished skyscrapers and hotels and things like that that have all come down and they've kind of replaced that with these boutique places but the saying, uh, you know, music saved Asbury Park is pretty true. And music brought the right kind of stuff back, the right kind of interests, the right kind of shows. Live Nation got involved. They reopened Convention Hall, which is the big sort of um, small arena there on the, on the beach. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Stone Pony stayed alive through all of it somehow. But I would say that in the last 10 years, it's really come around. And a lot of good venues have opened up. And... Uh, it's become a really, really kind of fertile place for young bands too, which is important. You know, a lot of places don't do that. They kind of just hope you come in and sell a thousand tickets and if not, screw you. <laughs> that's what being, being kind of cool about um, the the opposite to that. Like, you know, come in, we'll do, we'll see how we do. We'll have you back. Don't worry. Don't stress. And, you know, we'll sell some tickets, but don't worry. This is not that kind of place. Was that carousel that supposedly Michael Jackson owned, was that always there? Uh, yeah, the casino, which is at the southern end of the boardwalk near the Stone Pony. Yeah, that's been there for a long time, probably since the 30s. Hmm. Got it. So en enough about Asbury. Let's talk more about your greatness here. And one of the artists that you consistently tour and play with is Matthew Curry, who a lot of people say, hey, that's the next guitar hero. The way that Peter Frampton is a guitar hero, but there's songs and there's hits, but he can shred. But again, there's songs and there's hits. When did you start playing with Matthew? Uh, 2015, I joined him for a, uh, a nice spring and summer of shows. Um, again, blindly, I flew out to Chicago and he picked me up. You know, he was told there's a guy from Jersey flying in, go get him. And, um, I joined the band that day and that, that's almost 10 years ago, you know? So yeah, he's, a <clears throat> he's my most consistent project. I would say we probably do 110, 120 shows a year together all on the road. And, uh, we're going back out in a month, for a month and a half. And uh, that's our yearly Florida run. We go down there because it's warm and we can play outside. So, you know. You're getting to do a cruise with him too, I hear. Yeah, that's true. I forgot about that. Uh, we're doing the Rock Legends cruise, which leaves out of Miami and goes to uh, Dominican Republic. And that's with a bunch of cool classic rock things. You know, Rick Springfield's on the boat. And uh, oddly enough, uh, Sammy's the headliner on the cruise. So uh, I'll hide in the uh, engine room with the crew and shovel coal. No, according to Sammy, everyone's welcome to join him on stage at any time for any reason until you actually try and join him on stage. That's what I've heard. <laughs> so that's fantastic with Matthew in the versatility of what he's doing. And I, by that, I mean, he'll open for Steve Miller or Peter Frampton. So he'll be playing a shed or a huge theater. And then he plays something along the lines of the Iridium, which is more intimate. And then you have that Florida run, which are some real down home kinds of places that probably oh, yeah. feed you really well. But then there's a cruise. In other words, there's no two Matthew Curry gigs that seem to be the same. No, they've never, never been the same. There's been, uh, you named it. We, we can go from, and literally went from, several times went from an arena with 16, 17,000 people to something way worse than the Iridium 
uh, with five people because the show wasn't advertised. So you, you got to keep a, a positive demeanor about everything because that's just the way it is. If, if you let that get weird and like get like too high on one of those horses, it's never going to work. It's it's not 1975 and there's not like, you know, endless outlets for Matthew's kind of music. So you got to take what you can get and, and do the best job you can with the cards you're dealt and stay yeah. positive all the time. Uh, that's the most important thing. On any of the Steve Miller shows, did you get to encounter his drummer, Ron Wixo? This was before Ron was on the tour. Uh, back then it was Gordy Knudsen was the uh, the Steve Miller chair. Um, yeah, uh, but I know Matt knows Ron pretty well. So worlds collide once again. Because Ron and you both had the DLR gigs at different times there. So that's the small world nature of, of that thing. I think he did a year and a half, 94, 95, somewhere around there. I think so. Uh, judging by the road case that I opened back in 2021, that was full of Ron Wixo stuff. Really? Uh, and I closed it right away because I didn't recognize it. I didn't want to like open a tomb or anything like that and let a ghost out. But uh, yeah, I think it was around that time. I'll have to ask Ron if he's aware of his road case or gear being there. Uh, he is originally from Long Island. Rumor has it Ron was a lifeguard alongside David Duchovny and Fire Island in the 70s. We're still trying to investigate that. I'll buy it. Sounds good to me. <laughs> and so the Dave gig, I'm assuming, came from your Jersey roots in knowing a one Ryan Wheeler. Yes, uh, specifically that. And um, the way that went down was they had, um, you know, our friend Mike Musselman was behind the drums for like a year mm -hmm. in rehearsals and in the Vegas, early Vegas run with Dave. And um, for whatever reason, that kind of did its thing and they needed somebody else. And I happened to be in Jersey, of course, luckily at the time. And I got a call from Ryan that says, uh, can you come to Allentown? I was like, for what? He's like, well, just get here and we'll see what happens. And that was the beginning of the uh, the David experience and the David um the tour with Kiss and everything, so. Yeah, which included re-recording some of the most famous rock songs of all time and playing more arenas. So it's it sounds like you've been playing arenas more of your life than not at this point. Yeah, luckily. And I like playing them. They're great. Like, for a drummer, that's like, you know, it's like getting to use an amp for the first time as a guitar player. We don't have any amps. We don't have any cool things to do. We have no tricks. We just play the drums. So to be able to kind of present your craft in that environment it's really nice you can you can really present it how you want it to come out and broad and big and you know you know whatever you're looking for but yeah uh i've been very lucky that like 2013 till now i've had the chance to uh hit a bunch of them in all, all over the states all over the country so we got the yeah. staple center so i'm happy with that yeah in terms of playing arenas as a drummer there's the tommy lee school of showmanship where he's playing really complex things and hitting hard, but there's also the stick twirls, uh, those visual tricks. Did you ever have that as a phase of your drumming? Never, never, never. Uh, my singular mission in life is to play songs. That's it. I don't care if I'm even recognized. I'm in the back. That's where I sit. That's like, you, you wouldn't want your bus driver spinning the wheel too much. You know, you wouldn't want like that guy getting too crazy in his seat because if he goes off the road, everybody's dead. So I'd rather be more along those lines and kind of, you know, operate in the shadows and just kind of support the song. Yeah. I mean, the Tommy Lee times two kind of thing is the Vin uh, Vinnie Kalayuta story about him playing the Black Page auditioning for Zappa and flipping sushi in his mouth while sight reading and all that. When it comes to your auditions, is it usually the people hear the demos and then just say, get in the room? Or have you actually had to do sight reading kind of stuff? I can't read a note of music, frankly. <clears throat> There's a bombshell for uh, anybody who thought you need to read music to be able to get into bands and things. Um, <clears throat> I've auditioned maybe twice in my life for things. Otherwise, it's all through the grapevine. Uh, show up this time, this day, and just kind of have your stuff together and see how it goes. That's pretty much it. Like, uh, maybe once or twice there was a serious um, notation thing involved or a serious schooled thing involved, which I just lied to everybody and uh, learned it really well and showed up and played it and there was no questions asked. So that's the only way I know how to do things. And it, uh, it usually works <laughs> to a point. So it sounds more like the Jersey 
personality, good hang thing, maybe has had equal weight uh, to your musical competence. Uh, competence overall in other words it's not like okay the guy went to berkeley and he sight reads you're not one of those people you're not one of those people where the manager gets the gig for them and you're not one of those people where you're the weed carrier guy and that's how you got in as the drummer i've done that too you know it's a nice uh you know side gig within the gig usually so uh jersey is paid dividends for your career that's what i'm hearing jersey's everything uh for whatever reason uh it's it's the population alone. You're, you're bound to hit somebody there that has some sort of connection that they can you know feed to you and kind of help you nurture. But the most important thing that Jersey offers is the bar band scene. It's different than anywhere else. It's not Nashville. It's not Vegas. It's not L.A. It's not even it's not even South Jersey. <laughs> it is the uh, Central Jersey, North Jersey, Monmouth County, Ocean County bar band scene. That is where the the strong stuff shows up you got to be able to hang with anything you got to take a request and play it well enough to get the tip and uh and just be able to roll with anything you know so you started off as a teenager with all this yeah i joined um my first band at like 13 and we were doing gigs that year which was what 2000 something i don't know i can't remember um then joined outside the box when i was 15 16 and that was it. I've never done anything else. <clears throat> Just I've been in bands. I've never had any other jobs. Um, I've somehow stayed employed and uh, and gigging for, you know, 20 years now. So literally, like I, before I said, you've been doing arenas more of your life than not. You've actually been working as a professional drummer more of your life than not. Oh, yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. And uh, before I started actually playing you know gigs and stuff and tours and things uh i was playing since i was three for some reason again it works i have no idea why mm. i couldn't tell i never put any thought into it it just showed up and uh it seemed like the right thing to do so and it was a lot of fun and i uh i did that never looked back well a couple of uh lightning round easy on the fly questions for you i'm hoping these are easy for you all over the place and then i'll let you roam free because i mean it's a press day for you you got to speak to a lot of people and i just had the blessing of getting francis valentino for you know 25 minutes whatever it is the first question with the roth set what is the hardest daily roth song for you to play hmm. i would say the hardest would be unchained because the wacky pre-chorus that's it other than that, they all kind of float the same. Like Dave said, it's Patsy's Pizza. Once you have one slice, they're all kind of the same. Except for that one. That's a weird topping. The pre-chorus, for, for those who keep track of things within the songs, the pre-chorus is bizarre, and that reoccurs under the solo. So that's the only little quirk that is, uh, it makes you think for a second. Did you have to learn, you know, relate to that? Did you have to learn more songs beyond the set that you were playing? Because, you know, the set was the same every night on that Kiss run. But Dave is known for going, hey, learn everything. We learned a batch. It wasn't everything. I think that ship had sailed at the time when I came in. I think the other guys had maybe learned more. But uh, we learned a very concise thing for the tour. Mm -hmm. And throughout the tour, we picked up other things that would that would have been played in Vegas in 2020. Wow. That would have expanded that set to the 90 minutes that we would have done. But um, yeah, I, you know, a handful of songs. I knew most of them already, so I got lucky. Did you know Hot for Teacher before you got into the group? Oh yeah, I can do that if I have to. It's a, that one's like a marathon. That would be the answer to the first question if that were in the set. Yeah, uh, that used to be uh, in the era when Ray Luzier was on drums. That was the opening song most of the nights. And you go, so you're making your drummer do the hardest song at the beginning without warming up. So thankfully, you did not have to do that. Now we got a, uh, what was our first song on this tour? We got a nice Really Got Me, which is like, you know, you can just cruise on that one. That was that was a lot of fun. Mid-tempo. Uh, next question for you. Some drummers that I know, when they're not on tour, they still go to gigs a couple nights a week. They support their friends. They never know when they're going to sit in, et cetera. What's the last concert that you went to for fun and or networking? 
Uh, that would be the Ocean Avenue Stompers at the R Bar in Asbury Park um, on December 26th. Okay, so within the last two weeks. And you also played as part of that evening, ultimately? That was the reunion of Outside the Box? It, it turned out to be, but uh, that's a weekly thing. The Ocean Avenue Stompers have a weekly residency at that bar. And so I try to go whenever possible to support those guys. In general, are you a concert guy when you're off the road? Not really. A little bit. Like If it's something I really, really want to see, I'll definitely go to it. Uh, but to be honest, like on the other side of it, I get... I get a little bit of a little bit of anxiety out front to kind of like I can't stop trying to figure things out as far as like hmm look at that that's a I wonder how they ran that how this how they synced that up how the how the pyro was was dialed in with uh you know with the backing tracks and things like that so I, it's a little bit of a a workload so yeah I, you know that kind of thing yeah dentists don't want to look at teeth when they're not in the office I get it <laughs> um, so that said. What's the hobby or the passion when you're not on the road and you're not practicing for the gig or anything like that? Really good question. And uh, I've been told I need a hobby <laughs> by everybody I know, every single person, uh, Ryan Wheeler included out there. Um, I really don't have one. It is, it's just kind of waiting for the next gig, which is very unhealthy, of course, but that's the way it is. That's the way it's always been. And, uh, I don't, know if I'm, I don't think I'm going to change that chemistry quite yet. I mean, I, I like a lot of things. I love, uh, oddly enough, I, I, we, have, we have to fly so much with, with different bands. I, I just love, you know, traveling and love planes and flying and learning about planes and learning about, you know, the mechanics of that. And someday I would like to fly a plane. Someday. Oh. It's a lofty one, but that would be like a future hobby, a future thing I would get into. Well, that actually uh, accidentally flowed into the next thing, which I was going to ask, which is a person on the road as much as you. Are you one of those point collector, uh, credit card hack kind of guys that is able to use all those hotel points for good? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, depending on the tour. I mean, that's the, back to the early part of the interview with like going from arena to club. Uh, I often go from significant touring outfit to guy in a van so it's all kinds of hotel chains so in fact i keep track of everything in a spreadsheet and I, keep, I keep my hotel keys of where i stayed what night what airline i flew where i sat on the plane did i have an exit row was it an upgrade just so i have some firepower against the airlines and hotels down the road it's an obsession <laughs> okay the last <laughs> the, the last question is when you're on the road what keeps you sane-ish? And the reason I ask that is because the average person just goes to the concert and it's it's their Friday night, no matter what week it is. If they drink, that's the night that they have the, the five drinks, et cetera. And when you're a touring artist, at first you go, oh, free food? I'm going to eat everything. Oh, free booze? I'm going to drink it. And then you hit that wall where you go, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And then that person at the concert isn't really realizing that the person on stage is there for an hour and then the other 23 hours are spent waiting, lots of waiting around. So having done this for so long now, what keeps you sane on the road? How do you balance out and not lash out at people? Uh, number one is the company. It's the other guys or girls in the band and crew that keep you very level or very crazy. Uh, that's why you want the right people around all the time. And I've been really lucky with that. I've never had any problems with uh, with anybody else on the road. Zero after all this time. But I would say for me, uh, yes, I and we certainly tried to maximize all the free stuff, the ingestion of, <laughs> of uh, mass amounts of, of beer and booze on the road because we were sponsored for a little while, which was a whole different bag of worms. But that doesn't work. It's fun. You can still do it sometimes, but my thing is simply walking. I just go for, for walks and there's no better way to kind of like kind of recharge your mind in a new place. You might as well walk around and like see what's around and not even like restaurants and stuff. I don't care about that stuff. I just want to see like, like a thing. Like if, if we're near the beach, I want to go to the beach. If we're near like Niagara Falls, that's where I'm going. If we're like, you know, in the desert, I want to go into the desert, that sort of thing. 
And do those step counts, the pedometer things go on the travel sheet along with the hotel room number and your upgrades? For some reason, they don't. I tried that and it made me like buckle at it. I freaked out. I was like, I can't I can't look at myself and look at my life this itemized or else I'll, I'll collapse. <laughs> I noticed your shirt. There is a uh, is a T-shirt, tuxedo or a suit shirt and a tie kind of thing. Yeah, there's a reason I wore it. But please, you have a better version, probably. Uh, back in back in 2019, speaking of European tours, I was over there with the Billy Walton band, um, all Jersey guys. We had a horn section, um, sax and trumpet. Mm -hmm. Trumpet player named Bruce packed just enough T-shirts for every single day of the tour, sort of like the peel it off, fresh one in the morning kind of thing to avoid laundry. I guess he didn't realize, or maybe he did realize, that he had packed his final shirt as a tuxedo t-shirt. And uh, we had to go to Heathrow to fly back to, to Newark. And he ended up wearing a tuxedo t-shirt on the plane. So we're about to board the plane, London, and he panics, can't find his passport. Panicking. Um, board the plane. Um, we're on the plane, you know, call, uh, flight attendant, call button. Attendant comes on. If anybody finds an American passport, please ring your bell. And I should note that we're in the very last row. We're, we're flying, you know, we're in the, the last row of this plane, cheapest seats possible. And um, a guy in first class in the first row of the plane <laughs> rings his bell, stands up, and he's also wearing a tuxedo T-shirt and holding the passport. And uh, they met in the middle, and we went home. Tuxedo magic. It is. It's important. I, I That tops what I was going to say, which I'll share anyway, which is before you, I interviewed, uh, interviewed John Voigt. And I thought, yeah. that, I thought, you know, show some respect to an Academy Award and BAFTA winner with a great Seinfeld episode. And did he have his pencil, John Voigt's pencil? That did come up. I did yeah. ask him about the pencil and and seinfeld so i mean i'm just happy to be sharing this rarefied air of jay peterman that's all i'm here for <laughs> i mean the seinfeld people are everywhere and who thought that ye decades later we'd be talking about the drake and peterman and all that kind of stuff but it's all seinfeld really it's permanent it's, it's a lifelong commitment outro cast <laughs>